Welcome everyone to II's very first webinar. Um, we appreciate having you all here and we thank you for your patience. We realize this isn't the ideal kind of system for using a webinar, but uh, II, the Board of Directors, is very interested in exploring this option as a plan of training. And as we already have a subscription to go to meeting, uh, we decided to use that as our platform to trial it and gauge interest. So far, the interest has been very positive. Even those who haven't been able to participate have expressed interest. Uh, so if there is interest, we will explore using other kinds of uh, a more appropriate software uh, that would be more suited uh, for the system. We do have a maximum of 25 people, including the presenters on GoToMeeting, which is why the system started off so small. And hopefully we can expand this so that it will be uh, even larger and we'll be able to accept and, and facilitate more people. Uh, I would ask that if, uh, because of the system that we're using, if you are using any extraneous um, software or applications, if you are able to close those, uh, all of that takes bandwidth um, on this system and it might slow things or garble audio. Uh, so if you wouldn't take a moment to do that, if that's a possibility. Um, a few other housekeeping things. Uh, one question. Uh, often asked on webinars is if the slides will be made available and yes we do plan on making that available also as I indicated we will be recording this and therefore we plan to make that available both to you and to others who aren't able to participate due to time zones or other time conflicts the this webinar will be in two parts. Um, the first part will be a discussion by Florence Landsberg on incorporating ecosystem services in ESIA and what that is all about. And the second one will portion will be a discussion facilitated by Courtney Lawrence of City uh, about other uh, types of topics that you guys would like to explore uh, for future webinars. We will wait to have questions on that first section by Florence until the end. Uh, if you would like to type them into uh, the chat box uh, and you can send them to uh, the presenter or to the organizer, feel free to do that and we will read them. Uh, we're not going to open up the audio to everyone for discussion because that will slow things significantly. And we will do a similar thing at the end. Uh, if you would like to um, propose a topic instead of unmuting everybody and having an open discussion and, and without the benefit of being able, able to see people, it's very difficult to read cues into who's going to talk next. So we will plan to uh, have you type those into the, the chat boxes. So I realize it's not ideal, but, but we're really excited about uh, trying this out. Um, so. I would like to introduce our presenters today. Um, as I mentioned, the first presenter, Florence Landsberg, uh, will be talking about incorporating ecosystem services and ESIA. Florence is a research associate at the World Resources Institute. For the past seven years, she has focused on ecosystem service research and has both led and co-authored several reports on the subject. More recently, she has worked with assessment practitioners to develop a method for incorporating ecosystem services into environmental and social impact assessment processes. The Ecosystem Services Review for Impact Assessment, a non-technical version of that, will be published at the end of August 2013. The second portion of our webinar will be facilitated by Courtney Lawrence. Courtney is a Director of Environmental and Social Risk Management within Cities Corporate and Investment Bank. She has over 15 years of experience in the field of environmental risk management, and she serves as a technical resource and advisor for banks and clients on transactions in over 100 countries where City operates. She currently leads the Equator Principles Biodiversity Working Group. With that, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Florence. Thanks, Bridget. Um, so the as uh, Bridget was saying, the WRI has been working with the impact assessment practitioners on developing uh, the ecosystem services review for impact assessment. 
And the reason we um, worked on uh, that subject is WDR has been working on ecosystem services for quite a few years. But then the ESIA requirements, uh, some ESIA requirements changed. Um, uh, most notably, you have the IFC performance standards. So IFC is the International Finance Corporation. It's uh, the, the private arm of the World Bank. So it's the part of the World Bank that loans money to the private sector in developing countries. And they have a series of performance standards. And since 2012, uh, 1st of January 2012, they um, require the clients to, on one side, maintain the benefits from ecosystem services, but also to identify those services on which the project is directly dependent for its operations. So um, in other words, the IFC is expecting its client to uh, manage its project impacts and dependence on ecosystem services. So that's how we started working on how to incorporate ecosystem services into impact assessment. So this is a picture of the first training on the methods, the ESR to IA, that took place in Calgary at the last IEIE conference. And um, some of you might recognize Jill Trewick uh, in front, in the middle, in blue. Uh, she's one of the co-authors on the method. Um, and what I learned from preparing for that method, uh, sorry, for that training and conducting it and also being at the conference in general is I actually have been spending a lot of time, probably way too much, uh, speaking and discussing how to incorporate ecosystem services, but not as much on what does that does it actually mean? Um, so this is what uh, this presentation will really be more about. I really refrain myself from uh, bombarding you with information on how to do it. So I will first start with uh, uh, some basics on ecosystem services. And most of my presentation then will be on what does it mean um, to have ecosystem services? What is the difference from uh, compared to what we usually do uh, in an impact assessment process? And then I will just share briefly some lessons learned from our um, uh, road testing of the, the methods on uh, completed ESIAs. So ecosystem services, there are multiple definitions of ecosystem services. The one we are using is the direct and indirect contribution of ecosystems to human well-being. So for example, if you are in the Arctic region, you have the tundra, and the tundra contributes to the well-being of the hunter's household. Uh, through uh, contributing to their income and food, thanks to the reindeer meat. But that reindeer meat also contributes um, to the self-esteem of the hunters, according to how big the catch and uh, how many animals they were able to, to, um, to kill. And uh, that reindeer meat also uh, allowed the hunters' wives to socialize, because it's, it's a very important component in that part of the world to uh, bring, to contribute food uh, to the traditional uh, gathering. Then the tundra, in an, uh, another aspect, I mean, as more holistically, if you want, the tundra as a whole does contribute also to the sense of identity of the communities uh, in the area, because it also has a, a service that we can call the cultural heritage. So if we are trying to put a bit of uh, you know, terminology on all this, we have the ecosystem, so the tundra, which uh, supplies ecosystem services, which are the reindeer meat or the cultural heritage in this case, and then they are beneficiary and uh, that who derive benefits from these services. And so we are thinking of benefits in terms of income, livelihood in general, it can be health, or safety, or culture. So what's very important when we are looking at ecosystem services is to understand the environment from a social perspective. So we want to keep these links alive all through the assessment process. We want to understand how uh, the, project, the project might impact the tundra and what, at the end of the day, that would, uh, could mean in terms of impact on the income, the food, self-esteem and socialization, or other aspects of well-being that beneficiaries are deriving from that tundra. So now, what does that mean when we are thinking really on the, um, at the assessment process that we are already undertaking? Um, most of the time, we have environmental and social assessments that are conducted separately with little to no integration. So when we are looking at ecosystem services, we are complementing the social and environmental assessments that are already done. We are not replacing them. And you will see uh, 
throughout the presentation later, as there will be some example where we will highlight how much it could be an error to actually replace and say, oh, okay, let's get rid of the environmental and social assessments as we know them, and just let's replace it by ecosystem services, because we would miss impacts, either environmental or social. But what we will do by looking at ecosystem services, we are going to strengthen the integration. It means that we are going to really specifically try to understand how these social impacts could lead to environmental impacts, and in turn, how these environmental impacts could change ecosystems and the services they provide, and therefore have social consequences. So what we are looking at from an ecosystem service point of view is what are the social dimension of environmental impacts. And the challenge, of course, is knowing the way the SIA process takes place is that we need to keep this relationship between environmental and social alive all through scoping, the baseline, the impact assessment, and the mitigation stage. So when we scope for ecosystem services, so we are looking at environmental impact, but we want to keep that social dimension alive when we are scoping for this, um, for the, the, the one, um, for, for the, uh, sorry, for the environmental impact that actually could have social consequences. So we are going to select environmental impact based on, based on social criteria. And um, we propose two criteria. One is first, is that environmental impact actually going to lead to a change in well-being? An example, you could have an impact on the water quality. And, um, and, and so you impact a river, for example, that is used downstream, but people drink it, or bathe in it, or just enjoy it visually. Um, so you want to only select this environmental impact where people are going to be prevented from benefiting, having the same uses. So for example, if the change in quality doesn't prevent the users downstream to drink, bathe, or enjoy it visually, then there is no impact from an ecosystem service point of view. But that's where you realize that if you are only looking at these ecosystem services, you are going to miss some impacts. It might be from an environmental point of view, the hydrologist would say, well, this was pristine water, and by that change, we have actually a significant impact from an environmental point of view. So that's one of the reasons you can't just replace ecosystem services, uh, replace the usual ESIA process by ecosystem services, you would miss uh, some impacts. Then we, the other thing we are going to consider is actually whether the stakeholders are highly dependent. And so we you are going to consider whether they have alternatives or not, for example. And so if we have environmental impact that could lead to a change in well-being and people are not able to adapt to that change, then it means we need to assess the impacts further. Um, and so it will be part of the, it will be assessed in the further stages of the ESIA. This scoping, uh, at scoping, it's very important to have input from the stakeholder. So to understand who is dependent and how much they are dependent on an ecosystem service, you do need to engage your stakeholder. You actually could do the exercise at the stop, but very likely you would be wrong. Um, just I, from, I have a colleague who did it, and she, she was curious to see how, how, how close she could be uh, or by doing her desktop exercise, how close she could be from uh, having um, the result of prioritization or scoping, if you want, by the affected stakeholders, and she realized she actually was not that close at all. So now when we do the baseline, so we are looking at environmental impact, but we realize that they have social dimensions, the reason we are looking at it from an ecosystem service point of view. So it means we are going to do a baseline for environmental impact with the social dimension. We want to understand um, what, is, what is the current level of benefits people get from the tundra? Uh, so how much income of food? What is their level of self-esteem? How many times the wives are able to share meat? And what is the general sense of identity from the whole community? And how it relates to the service provided by the tundra? So we will, de we will uh, do a, an, an baseline for the environmental impacts that actually also describe the current benefits people derive. And then when we predict the, we do the impact analysis, first we are going to predict impacts. So we are going to look at how the environmental impacts on the tundra 
would impact the ecosystems and the services. And then we know we need to go one step further is what does that mean in terms of impacts on benefits? So how much would income, food, self-esteem, socialization, and sense of identity be impacted as a result of that impact on the tundra? So we predict an environmental impact in terms of change in benefits. So again, it's the mix between environmental and social. And now when we do assess the, the significance of impacts, we will use the same approach than for environmental impact, which means we are going to combine the magnitude of impact and the sensitivity of receptor. But we are looking at environmental impact with their magnitude in terms of benefits. So what is the magnitude of impact on the income, the food, self-esteem, socialization, and sense of identity, and then the receptors are the people. So how can uh, the hunter's household, the hunters themselves, or their wives, and the whole community react to that impact on the different benefits they will derive from the tundra? And then based on the impact significance, we will decide which impacts to mitigate. So now when we mitigate for ecosystem services, um, in, the, in the environmental realm, we are quite familiar with the idea of the goal of no net loss of biodiversity, and we use the mitigation hierarchy. So here we are going to adapt and tweak the, these principles to the uh, concept of ecosystem services, recognizing that from an ecosystem service point of view, we want to maintain, so we, don't, we want to achieve a no loss in benefits. And we are going to uh, um, apply the mitigation hierarchy. So we are going to first, in this case, let's imagine we have a, a project in the tundra that uh, it's a very small footprint, you know, on the total area, but it happens that because people value very much the wilderness of the tundra, that very small change, in uh, that very small footprint actually has a, a disproportionate impact on their sense of identity. Uh, and then now the question is, how can we mitigate for that loss in sense of identity? So first, we are going to start by, can we avoid to put the project in the tundra uh, at all? Maybe we can have part of some aspects or some components of the project that would be out of the tundra. So we are trying to avoid to affect the service so we don't have a loss in the sense of identity. Then we could also minimize the impact. Like, for example, during peak season, instead of having like a lot of roads, uh, transportation uh, that, that the hunters could see when they go hunt, we could try to maybe organize transportation so that uh, we minimize their, their, not just impression, but the reality that actually there is a lot. It's not just wilderness anymore. There is actually um, other actors than just the hunters and nature. Then we will uh, have restoration, but that's by probably will be after the project has left try to bring the tundra back to what it used to be and try to then bring back the sense of identity with it. The, um, I have to say that the, some aspects of well-being are much harder to mitigate than others, obviously, and a cultural service like this one, sense of identity, is very hard to have no loss. So here, uh, just this is a bit for the case of, of uh, the argument um, to just see that we are looking at the mitigation measure. So ideally, you will be able to, for example, have at least a no loss saying, well, let's open areas that, are, that used to not be accessible to the hunters, so maybe they can associate other wild areas to their sense of identity. And then, oh, sorry, the other one. And then um, ideally, we actually have a gain in sense of identity, so a gain in benefits. Can we get the project, like, improve the state of the tundra? that, uh, you know, we get, for example, reintroduce species that had uh, disappeared or something. And so the idea is that all the mitigation measures identified here will be part of the environmental and social management plans. Um, so we have road tested the method, but before I explain you the, what we learned from this road testing, I just wanted to quickly go through the six steps um, of the esr 4 ia so the idea is that uh, you would have this, th these six steps need to be, implement need to be implemented um, by a multidisciplinary team, but it could be led by, for example, the ecosystem service lead. And, um, and, and these steps 
uh, are meant to be really weaved into the ESIE process. So this is not supposed to be a parallel process just because it will cost more money and it won't be very effi efficient. But so the idea is that so coping stage you identify the uh, relevant services, which means the services that are impacted. But uh, the ESR4IA is also looking at dependence. One of the reasons is that the ESR4IA is an adaptation of a ecosystem services review, which was a method WRI developed with partners um, that was identifying the risks and opportunities arising from ecosystem change. And that method originally was looking at both impact and dependence. And then, of course, the IFC is looking at both impact and dependence. So the ESR4IA is providing guidance for both. But then uh, after step one, you will have a list of ecosystem services to be included in your uh, terms of reference. Then you have four steps during baseline. So you will first prioritize your services before to define the scope uh, and information needs for your assessment. At the end of step three, it's good probably to uh, sit down with your environmental and uh, the relevant environmental and social practitioners of the ESIA team to make sure that we are all in agreement to move forward. And then it allows you to establish the baseline because people will know what information we need them to bring back and to assess the project impact and dependencies. At the end of step five, we will have material to in incorporate in the ESIA report. But then step six is about mitigation of impact and management of dependencies. And as I said, then we will have identified measures that can go in the environmental and social management plans. Uh, and see, as you saw, see, can see the little stars is the idea is to have uh, some workshop to finalize. So step three, as I said, but also at, uh, finalize step five and six. Uh, then we actually um, road tested the method on four completed ESIA. There was a mining project in Africa, yeah, in Africa, one in the Arctic. There was an agribusiness in Latin America and a wind farm in Asia. And uh, <clears throat> sorry. So what we, the, the the very clear lessons learned is that we did unveil social impacts by integrating better the two assessments. Uh, an example is from the the the, ESIA, the completed ESIA in uh, the tundra in the in the Arctic, where the the environmental assessment had concluded that there would be no significant impact on the population of reindeer. And uh, they did that assessment at uh, the reindeer habitat level. But then when we looked at it from an ecosystem service, we actually identify another um, scale of analysis. We didn't want it at the ecosystem or the habitat level because that doesn't make sense from a hunter's point of view. We wanted it to be only in the area where the, hunter, the hunting runs. And then that um, is very likely to change the assessment of significance. I'm saying is likely because that's the problem with road testing on uh, completed ESIS is that we didn't have the opportunity to ask for more information. I think that will actually be a follow-up to the road testing, but at the time we didn't have the information to um, to see if indeed it would change the significance. There is good reason to believe it will because the project is actually in the hunting grounds. So it's very likely to actually affect the reindeer availability for hunters and therefore all the benefits that they derive from um, reindeer meat. The social practitioners were um, very happy because the way, well, at least, well, there are many ways to, uh, there are many lists of ecosystem services that you can use, but um, most of them, if not all of them, recognize that uh, the social services are put on the same level than services that would be related to livelihood. And for social practitioners who have a hard time to make their point about the importance of cultural aspects, um, in comparison to the livelihood aspects, um, they were very happy to see that we were putting different services, some related to livelihood and some related to the cultural, uh, the cultural aspects of uh, well-being on the same footing. Um, it's impossible to do a good job with only an environmental practitioner or only a social practitioner, and we have been um, we, we have pro provided some, if you want, some tools, some Excel spreadsheets and all that. And definitely, you need to sit down with uh, the, the two type of experts. So it's helping to facilitate to actually have common, the, to focus the two, the, two, the two expertise around the same issues, 
using the same vocabulary and terminology also by looking at ecosystem services. And then also it's really bringing back the importance of stakeholders, stakeholder engagement regarding to environmental impacts, um, very specifically on ecosystem services. You don't need to engage stakeholders on all the um, environmental impact, but when it relates to ecosystem services, it's going to impact their lives. And so they will help you to identify which ecosystem services are important to them and also possibly to help uh, find mitigation measures. So um, this is a bit our point of view. They, you know, other people are doing ecosystem services with another, um, uh, with other objectives. Our, our position was to put as an objective to have no loss in ecosystem service benefits. But I think in the IFC performance standards, there are multiple um, objectives written down. One of them is to maintain the benefits, but there is, I think, also to uh, preserve the value and function of the ecosystem services. So there are multiple points of view, and the good thing is by having the IFC performance standards, many people, many uh, practitioners are getting their head around it and producing a lot of uh, you know, material for thoughts. So I don't know if there are any questions or comments. Um, I'm happy to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. If you do have questions or comments, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. You can send them directly to the presenter, and Florence will see them on her screen, and she can go ahead and address them. Are there any questions? Hey, Bridget, do you want to try to unmute us and see how it, how bad it is? Because oh. maybe it's easier for the conversation. OK, I will try that. All right, everyone is unmuted. Wow. Are there any okay. questions? So Florence, I have a question. This is Courtney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm um, just reading a um, or, or engaging with the Nature Conservancy recently and the Natural Capital Project mm -hmm. on a um, a new framework of ecosystem services review or uh, ecosystem services uh, assessment um, using the concept of service sheds. Using the concept of what? Service sheds. Uh huh. I'm wondering um, if this is um, this concept is incorporated into uh, ESR for impact assessment, mm -hmm. um, and if you or others uh, who are participating have used the service shed concept in in, in their impact assessments. Okay, so um, uh, yes, I know about uh, their work, and um, we don't call it service shed, but we do discuss the fact that when you do the mitigation measure, so you are impacting the supply of a service yeah, by your, with your project, then the idea is that you can restore the ecosystem Ah, okay, thank you, Bridget. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay. so, uh, okay, so you have a project is impacting the supply of a, of a service. Either you restore that specific ecosystem to supply the same service to the same people, that's very important. It has to be up to the same people because we are looking at people deriving benefits. Or what you could do, which, and I think that's where it gets to the service shape, is that it might be another ecosystem. Florence? Yeah. Florence. Can I interrupt you? I don't know if um, others are having a hard time, but um, I, I do think that either we all need to mute through the GoToMeeting or um, or have Bridget mute us all. <laughs> Maybe I will let Bridget to mute us all. All right, I will mute us all and then I will unmute you. All right, Florence, you're ready. Okay, okay, great. So let me start back again then, if, I, if it was not understandable. 
So yes, I know about the service shed. We don't use uh, that uh, specific word, but it's the same idea. So if you have a project that impacts an ecosystem and the supply of services, when you do your mitigation measure, first you will avoid, minimize. Then you can restore the ecosystem you have impacted. But then what you could do also is, in, as an offset, is actually to get the benefit to increase, for example, the supply from another ecosystem, the same service to the same beneficiary. So it would allow you, with the idea of maintaining the benefits, it can come from the ecosystem that was initially um, impacted, and then you restore it. Or you could have, uh, you know, for example, if you destroy a wetland, you can, um, your project destroys, a, have to, you know, has to be built in that specific place and so destroys the wetland, you could make sure that another wetland increases its supply to the people who lost the, uh, the first wetland. So in that case, you are going to think in service shed. And uh, I think they have service shed and benefit shed or something. Uh, we try very hard to not add additional terminology, but it makes sense to look at uh, from a person perspective, because we are not looking at it from an environmental perspective, we want to maintain the benefits. So can it be provided by another ecosystem? Um, maybe if you, you want to uh, send me a text to tell me if I answered your question for me. Or you can be unmuted too. Courtney, did you have any follow-up? Must not. Oh, sorry there. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was... I, I'm wondering if um, if, if there's any uh, anyone on the you know who's on, on this webinar who who has used the concept of service sheds in the in the EIAs. Personally, Florence, I under, you, you answered my question, but I, I haven't seen them in impact assessments, and, and it, it feels like that might be the next frontier. Uh, that once we we actually start identifying ecosystem services within impact assessment, which is still rare, the next frontier will then be to, uh, to identify the, the different service sheds for each ecosystem service. Yeah, so I think you're right. It's, of course, it's not like widespread yet. But I have heard, uh, you know, when you have all the discussion on no net loss of biodiversity, people have had a really hard time to go to the no net loss of ecosystem services because then you are thinking about people. And then it's getting harder to define how are you going to achieve your no net loss if it's towards very specific people. It's not like if you can take the wetland and put it in another watershed. So you will have to define the watershed. I know that they have done, um, and you must know also, they have done some uh, trial of their uh, uh, software, the mapping software, to define where are the beneficiaries, and in relationship to where the beneficiaries are, where are the ecosystems that could provide the same service? So we have we put it as part of the mitigation measure, and I think you're right; it's the next frontier. Uh, Reinhardt has a question: How does ESR fit into strategic environmental assessment? That is, aspects that go beyond the pure project level. Florence? Yes. Yes. So is, I don't know if that is there, but uh, I've not been, I haven't been working yet uh, at the SEA level. I think what you would do, and Davide could speak more about it because he has been working on SEA and ecosystem services, so maybe if he's there we can unmute him too. Um, is my, my impression is what you would do is you are going to, for each development option, you will do uh, a little bit um, a state of which ecosystem services are going to increase, who is benefiting from these services, so who is winning and who is losing, and then how much are they losing and winning, and you have to look at how, how can they adapt to this change in uh, well-being as a result of, you know, different management, environmental management plan. Uh, but if Davide is there, he, he could say more. Um, so I have not, not personally been in touch, but if he if uh, I don't remember who asked the question, but I can uh, forward the um, information of David to that. Uh, Reinhardt, I did unmute you. If you had any follow-up for that, 
Or did that answer your question? Uh, okay, so, so uh, you, to a certain extent, I, actually the audio quality is quite uh, poor, so I uh, just grasped uh, some of the um, uh, of the answer. If I understand correctly, what you're basically saying is that you increase the scale of uh, what you defined as approaches at the project level, and you increase the scale to a wider, let's say, area. And in that area, you also apply the same uh, the kind of questions or the same methodology looking into biodiversity aspects. Is, is that more or less what you said? Um, yes and no. I, I think it's nice that you put it in uh, from a perspective of scale, because you're right, that's the key thing. What I think will happen at SEA level is you are looking at more what are called regulating services uh, that are less, uh, you know, uh, more like what people like to call public goods. So I think at the SEA level, you, that will be very good to do that kind of planning. Uh, I think what will be challenging at SEA level is that you will have to understand the beneficiaries. And uh, the smaller the scale, the more beneficiary you will have to um, you know, tackle. And so that's the reason I was thinking the best would be to speak to Davide Ginelletti, because he has been working on SEAs and ecosystem services in multiple places. So he could speak uh, with you know, uh, much more uh, experience in the back. And I can put you in touch with him if he's not uh, attending right now. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Naha has a question. Could they name a reference for these ecosystem shades concept? I cannot find any. Oh, the service shed? The shades, it says? It's a, perhaps service shed? Yes, Probably she says. Service shed, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I know, well, Courtney can uh, jump in, but I, I have one report, so it's not a peer review yet. They were in the process to have peer review publication, so I have one report. So the best would be to send me an email and I can send the report. Or put her in touch with uh, uh, someone at uh, TMT. Okay. Uh, she said, thanks, so I'll make sure we get the emails connected after okay. the session. Yeah. If there's no other questions, I think we'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to Courtney. And um, uh, Florence, if you could change the presenter to her. She has yep. the rest ah. of the slides up on her screen. Oh, and I, I will. Do that. You are the only one to. Am I the only one who can? All right, I will change it back to Courtney. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Courtney is a presenter, and you can sh um, opt to show your screen on the top. There we go. Right. So um, I think we wanted to um, brainstorm a little bit about uh, not only ecosystem service webinars, but also um, other um, other webinars that might be of interest to biodiversity to the the biodiversity an ecosystem services uh, group uh, within IAIA. Um, and, and so I, if you can, if you want to type in, um, you know, any ideas, um, I, I have some that I could also throw out to you, but I, I thought um, it might be helpful to get some thoughts from those on the, uh, on participating on the webinar. If you have any thoughts, go ahead and type them into the chat box. You can send them to presenter, and that will go directly to Courtney. If you send them to organizer, I'll, I know for sure I will be able to see them, and we'll make sure they get um, thrown out there, and we can always unmute individuals for further discussion. Any ideas? So, so why don't I, while, while, we're, uh, while people are thinking, why don't I... Um, provide a, an update or an overview of, of some of the um, initiatives that are, are happening in this um, field. One of them is um, within, there, there is an initiative called the Cross-Sector Biodiversity Initiative, which is comprised of oil and gas and mining and, uh, companies 
and Equator Principles banks, um, as well as the IFC and uh, the EBRD, some of the, the multilateral finance institutions. And there are um, two uh, topics that might be of interest to IAIA um, for future webinars. One is um, the work that that group is doing on uh, baseline data collection and how baseline, uh, you know, what is, uh, constitutes adequate baseline data. And then the other is really about um, what mitigation options, the cost benefits, uh, the costs and benefits of certain mitigation options uh, throughout the mitigation hierarchy. Uh, so is it more cost effective to, um, you know, do certain types of um, reduction uh, than, than, say, restoration later in the, in the hierarchy? Um, we do have, let's see, some, also some uh, other suggestions. Um, oh, I like the... Um, Someone said uh, we could do a webinar on differences in approach of assessing uh, policies versus projects under the concept. I think that's a fantastic uh, idea. And, and let me get under, see if I understand. Um, so if you take the, the Nature Conservancy's uh, service shed approach and you take uh, – you know, this, the ecosystem service review, and you could, there, there's a, a number of other ecosystem service approaches using um, GIS. Um, if you look at the policies um, of certain organizations that refer to those frameworks versus the projects that are actually implemented, is that, I'm not sure I understand. And maybe, um, Bridget, you could um, unmute attendee five. I don't know who that is. <laughs> okay. And I have names up, so mine don't come up as numbers. So that's oh. something different. <laughs> Even harder. Something in the testing part. <laughs> um, okay. I have, let's see, the one, two. I'm, I'm not sure if, the, if I count as number one on my list one, two. Um, Was the person who the the person who is responding to that um, or who su submitted that? If they can say it's me or something in chat, um, so that way I'll know who it is. Okay, got it. All right, is Naj N Naha or Naja? I'm not sure how to pronounce. Uh, yeah, my name is Naya. Can you hear me? Naya. Yes, we, I can, can you hear, hear me? you. Yes. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I meant more like whether there is a difference in methodology, whether you assess uh, projects or policies. Not so much in the, the way you presented it, but you take ecosystem as a kind of framework now in which you assess the policies or the project. So I was wondering more about whether there is a difference um, in methodological approach to it. Is that any clearer? <laughs> Courtney? Y y yeah, I think I think I think that's that's better um or, or clearer now. Um no, I think that's a that's a great idea. Um and I guess w what we would also um, maybe want to do is think about who could um who would be a good webinar uh presenter for that. Um, or, or maybe we could have several. I mean, that we could also team up to, uh, you know, to have several practitioners present. Courtney, I've gotten a few other suggestions. If if you would like me to list them now, or do you have some others yeah. you're exploring? No, that would be great. Actually, go okay. go for it. All right. Um, Laura Martin said, and I did change the options so that we can, it says that the attendees can view the list, but I don't know if that has changed on your system, um, if, if the names have now popped up or if they still show up as attendee number such and such. So hopefully that will help 
Um, I found an, uh, an option for that. Uh, Laura Martin says, what do you think is the link between ecosystem services and the economic displacement assessed as part of PS5 on land acquisition and involuntary resettlement? Could you repeat that again? Sure. What is the, what is the link between ecosystem services and the economic displacement assessed as part of PS5 on land acquisition and involuntary resettlement? That is a fantastic question. I love that one. That is, um, there is a direct connection, actually. So um, each of um, the performance standards um, can be linked directly to, um, to an ecosystem service or, or services that may be impacted. So um, for um, for services, um, production services like um, fisheries or agriculture uh, or hunting, all of those producing services, those um, can be directly linked to performance standard five, which um, is about land acquisition and uh, involuntary resettlement, but also livelihood restoration, right? So if you um, impact one of those, um, certainly economic displacement uh, may be triggered, and you would need to also apply that performance standard. Now, if you take um, an ecosystem service like um, uh, malaria, m mosquito control or malaria, you know, uh, disease regulation, that's going to potentially trigger um, performance standard four for community health and safety. And you would need to uh, also apply that performance standard. And, and just so everyone knows, within the performance standard six guidance note, there is a table that lists um, all of the performance standards and potential uh, ecosystem services that would trigger that performance standard. Okay, a couple others here. Uh, Tassiana said, suggested ex uh, webinar topic could be existing methodologies for each of the steps in the process. Absolutely. Uh, I'm assuming that means mitigation hierarchy, uh, steps in the mitigation hierarchy, or steps in ecosystem service review. Tassiana, I just unmuted you if you would like to respond. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. But it's very faint. Yes. Uh, uh, I guess I have some problems to be heard. Oh. Can you speak a little louder, Tansiana? No, it's uh, no. I guess I can't speak louder than I'm speaking now. And uh, you know, uh, I think that for each of the steps that you have to to follow, you know, even you know, for identifying all the <coughs> identifying the ecosystem services and everything else, you know. Each of the steps, you know, maybe there are methodologies. I'm, I haven't worked with this before, so, you know, I'm curious if there are different ways of addressing. You know. Hmm. Um, that's a good question, and that that would be a good webinar topic. I, I agree. Um, and let me know if this is um, what you're thinking. One of the things that occurred to me as Florence was going through her presentation is that it would be helpful to get in more detail about each step of the process, um, like scoping, for example, um, and how, um, how scoping of ecosystem services really works so that you get then a list that, uh, of uh, of services to focus on, um, yes, but, but that's what I mean by each step. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah, no, I think that's a great topic, and um, we're. I, I believe Florence is um, taking notes so that we can 
identify potential speakers um, for these webinars and then uh, put together a series if that's of interest. Thank you. Okay. Um, another uh, suggestion uh, by Reinhard was costing of externalities in biodiversity damages and positive and negative effects. Wow. Okay. Um, that's a great one. I think um, there's two aspects that could be addressed, um, and I'm, I'm interested in, in which one Reinhard is uh, referring to. Y you have um, compensation and, and offset. Uh, for biodiversity, but then you also have compensation and offsets for ecosystem services. Um, and I, I think um, compensation for ecosystem services that that that's the first evaluation of those services. That's that's a really new um, field, and it would be interesting um, to have a webinar on. Are you talking about Ecosystem services or biodiversity? Uh, let me unmute Richard Reinhard. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I, I did actually not distinguish. I was, was just uh, interested in some ideas about the uh, cost aspects. If you uh, would accept cost, because some people say they are, you cannot really uh, quantify this in from a purely economic point of view. But if you say, okay, we do, let's say, a project or we do some action, and that has an effect on uh, a negative effect, uh, um, let's say a pipeline or so, what does it mean in terms of biodiversity impact? And can we cost, can we give a, a value to that. Uh, there, there are other methodologies by other organizations, but is, would it be possible to address this in a, from an impact assessment point of view? That's, that's a question, more in general, not, not specific to the, the two alternatives you formulated. Thank you. Absolutely. And Florence, just for your notes, um, there is someone, uh, an IAIA member um, who you probably know, James Spurgeon who has done a lot of work um, on valuation of ecosystem services. He, he, he might be interested in, uh, in, in um, conducting a webinar on that topic. All right. Another suggestion is by Sukad. Uh, he would be interested in some coverage of resilience in ecosystem services and suggested Mike Jones, Rose Slutvig, Maria Partidario. Oh, fantastic! I like uh, I like suggestions for present for presenters, <laughs> and I, I also think that's a great um, a great topic, and it might be a, a a way for the biodiversity and ecosystem services group to uh, collaborate with the climate change group um, because I think there's some overlap there. Tassiana is suggesting valuing ecosystem services could be a great topic. Great. I agree, Tassiana. Um, and, and Tassiana, if you have um, any suggestions, I mentioned James Spurgeon, but if you have other um, yourself or, or other colleagues um, who would have a, a presentation that they could, they could give, it would be helpful. Any other suggestions? I see our, we're coming close to the top of the hour, but I don't want to um, miss any if you have some. Bridget, I'll, I'll um, add another. I, I'm particularly interested in webinars that can bring together um, communities of practice. So I, I mentioned, um, I, I think um, Sukad had put, had suggested uh, resilience, um, and that would bring in not only biodiversity and ecosystem services, but climate change. Um, similarly, it would be helpful to have um, a webinar on um, the social impact assessment methodologies involved in ecosystem service review so that you can bring in the social uh, impact community as well. All right. We do have Lara Martin chimes in one more vote for valuation of ecosystem services. So that seems to be a popular 
topic. Right. All right. And I do know that there are some people who have con come together within II about the topic of resilience. Uh, I'll do some checking on who those people are. I don't know um, specifically what they've been working on, but they have contacted me um, to kind of self-organize a little. So I'll do some checking on that. Okay. Fantastic. Any other suggestions? Uh, I do want to mention, um, Florence mentioned that um, attendee number 11, <laughs> and at the time I didn't know who that was, had sent her a message um, and asked if, she, if they could send an email. And so if that person could send a message to to me in, in chat or um, send an email directly to uh, Florence, that would be great. Okay, well, I think we had a very um, good discussion. I want to thank um, Courtney and Florence both for their presentations and all of you for participating and bearing with us in some of the, the technical challenges that we had, but um, a great discussion, um, great suggestions for future webinars. We've received, as I said, some very positive feedback, so I think we will definitely be looking to do this in the future. So thank you again, and if you do have any other suggestions for future webinars that come up um, throughout the day as you're thinking, as they come to you, please feel free to send them to either Florence or Courtney or myself so that we can explore them further. Thank you for participating in our very first webinar and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>